Bitcoin's what 30k, 40k again. Everyone's like hitting me up now. All my friends <laughs> I haven't heard from in like 10 years hitting me up now. I'm like, hey, what do I do with Bitcoin? Should I buy? <laughs> my number one advice to anybody, right, is don't buy everything all at once up front. Look yeah. into what dollar cost averaging means. Look into long term investing. That alone will be all that you need to know, really. And, and also diversification, right? Diversify. Swissborg. 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 Swissborg is sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the market. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no OBS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest. Corey Huang from Stably. We're going to talk about some awesome topics such as stable coins, trends in 2021, quantitative trading, and lots of cool stuff. So stay until the very end. And before we kick off, a shout out to Nate at Crypto Slate for being a legend. Crypto Slate is one of the best crypto websites for data and news. So please check them out at all times. Without further ado, Corey, thank you so much for coming on the show today. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show, Alex. Thanks for coming on the show, Corey. And you know, you have such an interesting background. I think the best way to kick off this interview is to act, ask you about your transition from private equity to the crypto space, being a quants guy. Let us know how was this transition, some of the lessons you've learned and your personal story. Yeah, okay, sure. Maybe I'll dial it back a little bit to uh, 2013 to when I first bought uh, Bitcoin. That's a, I think that's a good place to start. Uh, I was in college uh, and, you know, I started learning about stocks, market, investing. And so I figured, hey, Bitcoin, that's kind of cool. And it was back in 2013. Bitcoin was like $200 or something back then. Uh, <clears throat> and I experienced, experienced my first uh, crypto bull market in 2013. Got really excited about it. Uh, unfortunately, put more money into it toward the end of uh, 2013 and beginning of 2014. And then also experienced my first uh, crypto crash. So uh, that got me a little bit... Uh, this illusion, uh, you know, I uh, I was, uh, you know, a college uh, finance major and, you know, I was also learning about other type of uh, investment uh, securities like stocks and bonds that are more traditional. And so, you know, I was I thought that maybe Bitcoin was just another fad that it will blow away soon. Right. So I didn't bother looking too much into it. I refocused back into traditional markets. Uh, and then, you know, when I graduated school, I started working in, uh, you know, uh, retail banking and then move up into investment management, uh, which is also during this period, I taught myself uh, how to learn how to, uh, how to code. And uh, I uh, started learning how to build trading algorithms, you know, just on the side, not, not like professionally or anything. Uh, and, you know, I use open source platform like Quantopian to learn about, you know, uh, Python and also how to code trading algorithms using, uh, you know, both technical and fundamental analysis, et cetera. Uh, learn about quantitative trading, uh, the fundamentals of quantitative trading during this period. So um, uh, there was actually a meetup group in Seattle that uh, I frequent a lot, and uh, it was uh, for algorithmic trading. And you know, I decided to do some presentation there. And when I started doing that, it was a period when I was trading uh, VIX securities. I don't know if uh, most people are familiar with this, but uh, VIX is the volatility index for the stock market, uh, and and uh, basically what I was doing back then was I was shorting the VIX most of the time. Uh, basically, it's good to short the VIX like 80% of the time or so. 20% of the time is going to spike when market goes down. And if you can't get out during those periods, you're going to get wrecked, right? 
So I basically developed really good trend following strategy to basically pick pennies in front of the steam roller and hop off the train track whenever the train was coming, right? Um, and uh, I was doing one of these presentations uh, in 2016, teaching people how to build these uh, VIX shorting algorithm. And uh, I, that's where I met my uh, CTO, David, uh, at my current company. Uh, but back then he was still working for Amazon. Uh, he showed up to the meetup, he saw my presentation and afterward he came up to me, he was like, hey man, I see what you're doing. I'm doing similar stuff too, but uh, you're not hedging your, your, your algorithm. So what happens if uh, a nuke uh, explode over New York or like, you know, if the president get killed overnight, you're, you're, you're gonna lose all your money. And I was like, well, what's the chance of that ever happening? But like, he does have a point. And so he taught me how to hedge it. And that's how I knew, you know, David was very smart and he was like, you know, three, four years younger than I was. And, um, and so, you know, we became, re became really good friends there. And, you know, at that point we, we got really involved and interested in crypto at that point. And so we thought, why don't we go out and start uh, a crypto company uh, in, in the space? Cause this is obviously the future. That's super cool, you know, and for those watching out there, so according to many, many sources, algorithmic trading accounts for 80% of all trading on Forex and on the stock market so algo trading is definitely one of the biggest tendencies in trading today now i want to ask you a question corey so you said that algorithmic trading it actually helped you gain most of the gains and the upside but it saved you a lot on the downside like how much of a position for those watching out there in layman terms or something very simple like how much of it would you use in terms of algorithmic trading and how much of your percentage would be in just hodling right because those who are hardcore bitcoin hodlers it's really hard to say right it's never completely one way or the other it's usually the ratio of the two but do you have any tips based on your experiences so far in that sense since i am speaking to a very broad audience group uh i will keep it very uh simple uh, in my personal opinion, the best way to invest in anything is to dollar cost average and huddle long term, right? Don't buy everything up front, buy a little bit every month, every week, every quarter or whatever, every year, uh, so that you don't, you know, put everything up front and it drops on you, right? And uh, just hold for as long as you can, have a really long term vision. That's the best way anybody can, uh, you know, make money uh, from any markets in the long run. With that said, uh, if you are kind of the more adventurous type, I would say, and uh, the types that are, you know, more looking for of uh, intellectual pursuit mm. more than uh, return. I mean, I gotta start there first, right? It has to start yeah. there first. And then, you know, if through this uh, pursuit of, you know, uh, wanting to learn about algo trading and quantitative analysis and all that, you know, you decided that, hey, I'm gonna use this and apply it to my money, that is the best way to arrive at it because if you do that you know yourself how much money you want to put into this because you're learning yourself you're the student yeah. right do you really trust yourself right it, it, do you really trust yourself of building an algorithm and giving it 100 percent of your money probably not right maybe you, you because you know yourself you can moderate yourself right um and so that's that, that's my uh basically advice or you know, um, something that I would share with everyone else who is looking at algorithmic trading. Don't look at it as something that could make you a lot of money rich yeah. overnight yeah. or make life, you know, or it just make money passively for you on the side. It could, but you know, as with all things, it's not like, you know, an overnight success story. Uh, it takes a lot of time, dedication, learning. Again, it is a intellectual pursuit. It's not something that, you know, anybody can pick up overnight and make money with. That's super cool. And 60 to 80% is crazy over a year of performance, especially when you're hedging the downside of things. Like if people want to test out algorithmic trading for Bitcoin, like what are the kind of percentages, annual percentages that you would go for? Or what is the average at the moment? Have you seen any different platforms offering different? Yeah, there's, there are different type of algo trading strategies, uh, ranging from market making to arbitrage to, uh, you know, momentum directional trading. So, um, you know, arbitrage, for example, if you do it right and during certain market condition, you know, you can get annualized return that is triple digits, you know, easily. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, directional trading, uh, you know, if you manage to cast a trend really well and manage to also dodge uh, a lot of the downside uh, movement, then you are able to, you know, 
uh, make a lot of return in that sense as well. Um, usually with uh, with those strategy, with trend following, uh, again, you'll never get 100% of the upside when something's moving up. You'll catch like 60 to 80% of the upside. Uh, the wonderful part is when downside comes though, you'll yeah, dodge yeah. like the majority of the downside. And that's where the, that's where the secret is. The secret is not to uh, make a lot of money, is keep as much as, you know, as possible of what you already made. Uh, and that's basically will provide the foundation for you to compound into you know the next next level. That makes a lot of sense. Really well said, Corey. Thank you so much for that. And I'd love to ask you kind of the the kryptonites, quote unquote, as the enemy of algorithmic trading. You know how when Bitcoin tends to crash, it brings down the entire market with that, and a lot of the bots are triggered. Do you one day see like algorithmic trading being able to trust different asset and just not just follow Bitcoin as the mother of all assets and have a, some sort of decoupling of the different assets, being able to gain value while another goes down a little, little more similar to the stock market? Ah, uh, So I guess uh, this question is uh, basically, do I think that algorithmic trading could uh, adversely affect market structure for crypto and the way it behaves in the future? Perfectly put. Exactly. It could. It could. Uh, but it also could significantly improve it. Uh, you know, where, let's say back in, you know, stock market before computerized trading, before, you know, uh, E-Trade came about, before algorithmic trading came about, before high frequency trading came about, right? There was a lot less liquidity in traditional markets, a lot less volume. That means regular investor like you and I, it was more, that would, it would be more expensive for us to participate, mm, yeah. right? Every, back, way back in the day, every time you want to buy and sell a stock, you got to pick up the phone, call your broker, and he will charge you a, <clears throat> a commission. Right, a percentage every time you uh, buy and sell the stock. Yeah. Now that you can buy and trade on Robinhood for free, you know, yeah. so yeah. technology has came a long way. And and high frequency trading you, that gets a lot of you know negative press uh, every now and then for causing flash crashes and whatnot. But you know the truth is, without high frequency trading, you know the market wouldn't would not have as many institutional uh, 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 players providing liquidity. Uh, into it and without liquidity there's going to be less trading activities less volume less volume means bigger spread bigger spread means higher cost for you and me uh and everybody else so um yes i i think it could be bad if uh you know it uh it is uh done in a uh, unsustainable or negative manner but that's not the way, you know, that's not how I think it's unfolding. I think right now uh, the industry itself is evolving and growing very, uh, you know, we, we've gone a long way since 2013, since the day of Mount Gox, right? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, over time, uh, I, th I think, you know, things will get better and more institutional players will come in, more, you know, traditional quant shop uh, from Wall Street. They'll come in with their capital with their algorithms and you know they'll add to this market and make it more active and dynamic and yeah we'll, we'll go from there awesome buddy great answer and i'd love to transition you were talking about 2013 if we could fast forward all the way to 2021 i'd love to ask you a few questions related to crypto trends if you don't mind and corey i know you understand stable coins to the t with stably i would also love to ask your opinion of overall on crypto asset uh crypto as an asset class or DeFi. But uh, it's starting with stable coins, Corey. How are we doing so far in 2021? Are you liking so far what is happening with USDC that got approved in the United States? And what are stable coins looking like in 2021? How important is their role for adoption as well? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, I'm very, very bullish stable coins. You know, the total stable coin market cap is, I haven't checked lately, but I bet it's, you know, probably, uh, I don't know if it's more than $100 billion yet, probably uh, approaching there at some point. But, uh, you know, it, we, the industry has grown significantly from where it was in, in, in you know, back in the day, it was only Tether. Uh, up until when I was trading in 2017, you know, when I got back into crypto again, there was only Tether around. I remember, you know, back in the day, I was trying to figure out where to park $60,000, $70,000 worth of uh, you know, money and crypto money. And Tether literally was the only available option at that point uh, if I didn't want to cash back out into fiat. And, you know, from from a market that had only one player in it and so much demand to now a market where we have not only Tether, but we have USDC, Paxos, TrueUSD, 
ourselves uh, stably. Uh, Gemini, and now you know we have decentralized stable coins that are you know even like a different type of flavor that are coming out. Um, it's just incredible, you know. I think the, the amount of innovation uh, being made in this space is. Uh, uh, I don't want to say it is spearheading the entire industry, but it is one of the spearheading factors of, of this uh, crypto industry. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I do hope that, you know, uh, regulators and institutional players will adopt stable coins this year uh, more formally. Uh, I hope regulation that specifically mentions stable coin come out this year and provide more clarity so that players, not just banks, but also other players like Amazon and Costco and Walmart can jump in the space without any tail and, you know, provide, you know, their own brand of stable coins. I think that'll add a lot of value and benefits to consumers. Yeah, most definitely. And for those who want more information, don't forget to check Crypto Slate. There's a great article by Shoria. Here's why stable coins like USDC going legal is bullish for DeFi. I'd love to ask you a follow up question on this, like Corey, like in terms of the stable coins, do you have any preferences and how can people actually trust which and what stable coins? And are you mainly bullish on the USD stable coin? Or are there other stable coins that, that are coming up that you find can be really, really exciting for our space? Yeah, um, there are different types of stable coins in terms of you know, what the, the stable coin is um, uh, pegged to. And also, uh, you know, how uh, the stable coin itself is structured. So in terms of what it's pegged to, you know, there's US dollar, there's other foreign currencies like Canadian dollar. We launched a Canadian dollar stable coin with one of our clients uh, earlier last year. Uh, there's, you know, emerging markets that I'm paying a lot of close attention to, uh, like Vietnam, for example. We worked with a client late last year to launch a stable coin called VNDC uh, for the Vietnamese market. And uh, for those who are, you know, familiar with foreign uh, uh, currency markets, you know, if you go to Vietnam and you walk into a bank over there, uh, the VND is paying you six, seven percent right now, six, seven, eight percent. If you're lucky, you can probably find a bank over there that's paying ten percent on, on on your uh, cash deposit. Now, you know, banks over there, high risk, some issues, communist country, capital control, yada yada. So there are some trade offs, right? But for those who are looking for returns that are more than 0.01% that, you know, that, what's going on in your Bank of America account right now. It could be a very attractive uh, alternative uh, for those who are looking to engage in international trade uh, with like Vietnam or any of these emerging markets, for example, right? Using stable coins, it means payment or uh, international settlement it makes complete sense, right? Uh, so uh, I'm very bullish. Um, you know, stable coins and other uh, foreign currencies uh, that are, I, I believe, will come out in droves this year. Uh, I'm also very bullish on um, stable coins that are more than just fiat back, right? So there mm -hmm. are fiat back stable coin, meaning uh, tokens that are collateralized yeah. by a reserve yeah. of uh, fiat money sitting somewhere in a bank account that is held in trust. Maybe there's a trustee. Uh, it's probably an auditor involved that's, you know, making sure that everything is transparent and audited. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, that's that's what we call a organic stable coin, a generational one, foundational cornerstone stable coin. Uh, what we are starting to see now is, you know, generation two, three and four. Uh, generation twos are decentralized stable coin that may take in generation one stable coin as part of its collateral. Mm -hmm. Right. So an example of this is uh, MakerDAO, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Multi DAI. Multi-collateral DAI, yeah. Yes, multi-collateral. Uh, they, they can take in Generation 1 stablecoin. You can put in USDC yeah. uh, and collateralize uh, DAI. Um, and then you started moving into the third generation that came out in 2020, which is the Meta stablecoin. It actually came out a little bit before in 2019, but 2020 was when they really took off. Um, meta stable coins for those again for those who are not too hip with the terminologies, they are um, basically stable coins that are made up of other stable coins. Uh, and, and you know why do you want to create a stable coin that's made up of other stable coins? Well, uh, the reason is uh, first of all, it's always diversification. Diversification is good. And uh, second of all, if you create a stable coin that is backed by other stables, uh, you can create smart contracts that are completely automated, uh, you know, uh, on chain 
that would do the job of you know aggregating these other stable coins for you right so you don't actually have to set up you know a centralized entity like like an organic stable coin right in order to do this so now this meta stable coin you can put different type of on-chain stable coin that follow different type of strategies or you know being in, uh, being involved with various different DeFi, DeFi protocols and the end result is these meta stable coins are able to generate uh, very high yield. You know, yeah. Yields that goes yeah. from five, six, seven, eight, nine percent to twenty percent. And I've seen stuff out there that goes to a triple digit and a quadruple digit return. At which point you start asking, man, is this a Ponzi or is this a stable coin, right? But um, uh, so so the technology is evolving for this. Uh, very experimental. Uh, an example of this is you know Origin Origin do uh, Dollar uh, OUSD. Oh. Uh, when they first launched, I was very excited about. I thought it was a great piece of technology, uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, they didn't do enough uh, uh, smart contract auditing. And uh, one of the, uh, you know, one of the users uh, found out that, that there was uh, an issue with a smart contract. They exploited it, and you know, I think took like eight, seven, eight million dollar away from the smart contract, and basically. <laughs> basically yeah. uh take the project you know so absolutely yeah so i mean that's the what's the to 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 the community that's a big crisis of you know reputation and faith right like how can i trust this protocol again so unfortunately you know as the in industry evolved there will be situations like that like that you know, yeah you can't avoid it you know when they first made uh when they made airplanes you know how many people like had to like go up and never you know return home yeah. right and in order for us to have the planes that we have today actually well i don't remember it was the 787 the 787 was the first boeing plane commercial airliner that was integrating fly-by-wire uh control system and uh basically it was basically computerized control system steering system for the plane and in this is during the 70s i think boeing took all of their best all their top computer engineers put them onto the airplane during the, the flight trial. And their reasoning was, you know, this plane, this is all we have, all of our technology, our investment is on this thing. If it goes down, you know, we're, you know, we're gonna have to like, that, that's it, right? So we can't let it go down. So they literally put all the software engineers that they had back in the day onto that airplane to make sure that if something happened, they could fix it while it was in flight and they wouldn't lose the plane. Sounds crazy, right? Well, guess what? While it was mid flight, something did happen. Right. And they couldn't they couldn't um, I think it was something with the, the tail of their airplane or something like that. It wouldn't uh, steer and the airplane was going down. And so the engineer has to, like, you know, troubleshoot and fix it. And oh, they did it. Right. And they saved the plane. So you now if it, and what I'm trying to say here, those engineers, they're the ones to be commended. Right. They put their 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 life on the line. They put their, you know, everything they have onto the line in order to make sure that we make progress. The origin dollar team, they put their money on the line too. You know, they lost money in that attack too. So it's not like, you know, uh, they made this and create a lot of damage and they left. So, you know, I think they have skin in the game and they they try to make a difference and too bad it didn't work out. They'll learn from it and they'll make an improvement and we'll, we'll the whole industry will learn and grow from, from there, so. Sounds good, Corey. And for those watching out there, don't forget to tell us which stable coins you're currently using. Are you yielding on any, any platform? Let us know what are your favorite platforms in the premier chat a uh, question for you Corey. so you're just talking about yields which is really interesting i think yields is probably the biggest topic when it comes to stable coins and i had a message and by the way shout out to jm to Ger Ger gerard and uh, all our friends who've been messaging me about this but the us dollar according to some of the sharpest economists in the game could lose up to 10 percent of its value in 2021 uh, based on other, you know, currencies of the major assets like the British pound, the Japanese yen, the euro, et cetera, et cetera. So the U.S. dollar is definitely not looking hot. It already took a beating in 2020, plus the the current, you know, bill stimulus bill that has been voted. That's gonna just hurt U.S. dollar even more. And so a lot of people are wondering, like, I don't want yield in U.S. dollar. If I can, if I if I get 15 percent, you know, and and it goes up 10 percent in terms of inflation. Is this stable coin really worth something? Am I actually losing more money by having these type of stable coins? So I'd love to hear your angle on this, Corey. Yeah, I would say that the dollar having inflation and losing value versus other currency, yes, that's a very real risk. Um, however, is it you know a big enough risk to warrant you know 
people start dumping the dollar and not, you know, using the dollar at all, I think that's a little bit overblown, you know. Uh, for what it's worth, the dollar is still the world's number one reserve currency. Uh, it's still, you know, oil is still being traded in dollar, as far as I'm concerned at the moment. Um, and there are, uh, if you look at the stablecoin market, what is the number one type of stablecoin out there? U.S. dollar peg stablecoin, right? It's not ruble, it's not yen, it's not euro. In fact, people are trying to do euro stablecoin for a while uh, now, and you know uh, it hasn't gotten just as much traction as it has with U.S. dollar, and that's not because you know the euro stablecoin company is not as successful as the U.S. dollar stablecoin. I mean, it's just that's what the market have decided. That's what the market wants. In terms of how people can uh, still kind of like hedge or you know protect themselves from uh, inflation and you know uh, their U.S. dollar losing value uh, from you know these uh, interesting times that we're living in. Uh, definitely, you know, the, you always have options of uh, uh, diversifying into other assets that are historically anti-inflation, like coal like Bitcoin, uh, like, you know, there's even government uh, treasury that are inflation protected, right? So if those are really your concerns, then, you know, that's definitely something that, you know, you can do to uh, address this problem. Um, but, you know, it would be very extreme per se to like, you know, completely switch, you know, convert all of your assets that are based in US dollar over to, uh, crypto i mean you could if you want to live that lifestyle and I, I reckon had you lived that lifestyle in the past 10 years it would have done really well right so uh, it all comes down to how, how much of a bitcoin and crypto believer are you <laughs> yeah that's a really good point you know i usually tell them i say listen i use stable coins in yields just to be ready for crashes to accumulate on sats right so i, I always have it more as a backup plan and a fast trigger, you know, and and for those watching out there, by the way, the Swiss franc has performed extremely well against the U.S. dollar. I've I have I've had quite a ratio of my fiat in Swiss francs since the early last year, and it's been working really, really well. Uh, thank you so much for that. So I'd love to ask you a next question. So transitioning from uh, stable coins and hearing a little bit more about Stably, you know, I heard you guys are collaborating with uh, Tezos. Tezos is a mm -hmm. great, great chain. We haven't heard a lot about Tezos these days. Are you bullish, Tezos? How are you feeling the progress with that chain? They've been a little bit discreet, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, let me maybe I'll talk about Stably first, and I'll transition over to Tezos. Um, so Stably nowadays, we uh, so as maybe as uh, you may know, or uh, a lot of the people uh, watching the show may know. We launched a stable coin called USDS uh, in early 2019. And um, really by a stroke of luck, we managed to get listed on Binance and uh, you know beat uh, Gemini Dollar from, uh, from getting listed in the same spot. So that was pretty lucky. That gave us a lot of um, you know, reputation, momentum going forward. But uh, you know, honestly, we never really intended to uh, you know, go head to head with Tether and USDC and Paxos and all these guys because they're way too well funded versus us. Uh, we always had the intention of tokenizing different asset classes more than just US dollar, even other uh, currencies, right? And we did the US dollar first because it's the easiest thing to do. Uh, it was straightforward, didn't need too much uh, you know, legal research or analysis or opinion. And uh, we had a, a regulated, uh, trust company that was willing to do it for us. And so we went ahead and did it. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, we uh, focused on to expanding our tokenization department into other asset classes. And not only that, we focus on doing it for enterprise clients, not for ourselves, because again, you know, Stably is the, we're a startup, we're new, we're young, that's cool and all, but like in terms of brands and user base, we don't have any of that, right? So uh, it wouldn't, be as good uh, as good of an idea to build you know a token or a stable coin in our brand as opposed to for for a client that has a much bigger brand right so that's how we uh grew our tokenization business and then we start acquiring you know very very major enterprise clients uh, ranging from crypto exchanges to precious metal dealers to banks and other stable coin companies and you know recently we had um a fintech company that catered to the esports market 
that approach us and uh and they talked to us in november and you know within a month we built and created a, a stable coin for them branded under their own brand it's called zatara and uh it is uh going to be used for esports use cases so you know uh gamers millennial gamers and esports enthusiasts uh they like to send money to, to or, or you know uh participate in in tournaments that pay out prize rewards and, and, and things like that that are up money tire value uh and it's very hard for you know for them to transfer these money to the players when you know the tournaments is over in fact i think uh there are some tournaments that completed last year uh, tens of millions of dollars. They're still, you know, distributing the price as of right now, right? So, um, so it was pretty exciting to see, you know, a very unique client approaching us and asking us to build, you know, a tokenized dollar for them for this particular niche use case for their brand. Uh, and then we had, you know, clients that are, you know, more unique. Like we had this precious metal dealer from Canada that uh, are very interested in, you know, uh, opening up a new distribution channel for their uh, products, for their precious metal product. And so, you know, tokenizing it and, and offering it as a uh, uh, metal back token made a lot of sense. And so now we're working with them to, to uh, to tokenize gold, silver, and a lot of other precious metal and bringing them to market soon. So uh, really exciting time. Uh, we look forward to having more and more uh, enterprise clients like this uh, in 2021. In addition to enterprise client, there's also blockchain foundation that have started uh, working with us. Uh, the enterprise clients we have is the real world clients, I would say. And whereas the blockchain foundation is the digital world clients. Uh, you know, the real world clients that want to bring their assets onto the blockchain when, when the blockchain clients want to grab these real world people onto their platform, right, to bring activities. And then they start reaching out to them like, hey, help us, you know, bring your product, bring your clients, your activities users over to our platform will be more than happy to collaborate with you guys and you know that's how the uh, partnership with uh, tezos came about uh, with uh, digital bits which is another uh, blockchain uh, platform that we partner with and we also have plans to uh, work with you know more blockchain platforms out there as well our thesis is uh you know uh, there probably won't be a convergence in blockchains uh, I think every year there's going to be more, more, you know, newer, faster, better, more unique blockchain with better technology, unique technology coming out that's just going to, you know, blow the previous one out the water. Uh, and uh, whatever it is, you know, they're they're going to have the same problem: fiat on ramp, stable coin, you know, needing to bring tokenized assets and user activity onto uh, their platform. So. Uh, Stably will be there. We'd be more than happy to work with these guys. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully that will be a long-term, uh, you know, uh, sustainable business model that uh, are, it's very new. Uh, and we're hoping to uh, validate and prove out this uh, business model for uh, in the next two or three years. Awesome, Corey. Congratulations with all that. And we would love to follow up on Tezos, but not just Tezos. Maybe we can keep it a little more general uh, and just talk about the battle of the blockchains. No battle as in bad blood, but battle as in competition to just offer a more scalable, a more intercompatible, you know, connected blockchain. You know, a lot of people are really bullish with the ETH 2.0 transition, but obviously there's also the upcoming of some really strong chains, as you know, Polkadot, Kusama, we have Cardano, we have Elrond, we have lots of third gen blockchains coming up. And a lot of people are worried about how long it's going to take to transition to ETH 2.0 and the timing is the factor, right? Because if it takes too long, it's very likely that some projects will leave and end up migrating to another chain. But what is your overall view on Tezos, not just Tezos, but all the other third gen blockchains and how this may, may play out in 2021? I, uh, I think that, you know, obviously if you're trying to be faster, uh, cheaper than Ethereum, then, you know, there's a lot of alternatives right now, ranging from Neo to Polkadot to um, Cardano to whatever, right? Um, how come none of them are, you know, doing as well as Ethereum, right? That first mover advantage of Ethereum is really strong. It's really hard to beat. Like, how come none of the other stable coins are beating Tether? Because, you know, Tether's first mover advantage is really strong, even though there's a lot of controversy around Tether, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. However, uh, does that mean that there's no room at all for these, uh, you know, alternative kind of compete with Ethereum and adopt and try to attract users? No, absolutely not. In fact, uh, the reason that, you know, uh, 
a lot of these blockchain partners come to us is because they want us to help them figure out that problem. Like, how do we bring more user and adopt our blockchain, right? And to us, a lot of the time is, you know, other than just faster and cheaper than Ethereum, which like everybody is saying that already, right? Yeah. What else? What else do you have? What else can you do for uh, other people? Or like, you know, most importantly, what is your go-to-market strategy? What is your target market? Who are you trying to target, right? A lot of blockchain platform, they have more of a global, you know, ambition and be like, oh yeah, you know, blockchain platform for like, you know, eventually 10 billion people in the world and stuff. Okay, that's cool and great, but you know, uh, Ethereum's already doing that. So you're gonna have a hell of a, lot of a steep uphill battle if you wanna go toward that whole entire market. But I'll give you an example. If you focus on a niche market, right? Like um, this is not one of our client. I'm just giving out an example, uh, Tomo Chain. Tomo Chain is a fork of Ethereum uh, in Vietnam that is faster and cheaper than Ethereum, right? Uh, and I think Tomo Chain is really cool. I'm actually a, a fan of Tomo Chain because I'm also Vietnamese and you know I wanna support uh, technology that are <laughs> our own. So Tomo Chain, partner recently with the Vietnamese uh, government to supply their, their blockchain technology to, to help, uh, I think it was the Ministry of Education or something like that, to uh, build application onto their platform. And that will also help educate you know, the, 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 the government and the country and the people on blockchain technologies. These are the kind of niche target market plays that I think blockchain companies should start looking at, right? Because you need, you need like, you know, you need to solve real world problem and actually bring value and benefits to a certain group of people for them to actually adopt your technology, right? And um, instead of trying to focus so globally, maybe look for something smaller that are more manageable and really just nail it down. Just knock, knock that one out of the park. Uh, let's say, you know, cannabis processing in the United States, for example, right? That is something that is a huge space that, you know, I don't see a lot of uh, blockchain companies are actively tackling. Stably as a stable coin company, we are, you know, going into that space and we see tons of opportunities and we're already working with clients in that space. And now we're talking to our blockchain partners like, hey, you guys ever look at cannabis in the U.S.? Like, you know, and then they're like, no, yeah, tell us more. And I'm like, OK, so, you know, you can do this and this and this and that will bring you transaction and volume you can monetize it this way and these are the you know suppliers and vendors if you have a strategic partnership with them you basically have the whole entire supply you know the whole entire market uh, and there's you won't have other competitors blah 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 you know that kind of thing so they need to like thinking more in, in terms of the aspect as opposed to being so evangelist right mm -hmm. i think right now it's more being being evangelist going out and preaching the message and spreading the gospel of blockchain and how our protocol is better as opposed to like, hey man, if you do this this way, you'll save this much money, you know, acquire that much client, dominate this much percentage of the market. You know, I think, I, I, so that's, I think that's the shift in mindset a lot of these blockchain uh, companies need to start doing. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, if I could quote Philip Kotler, who's probably one of the biggest marketing gurus of all time, he, he said, there is only one winning strategy is to carefully define the target market and direct a superior offering to that target market. So the Tomo chain analogy makes a lot of sense. And, you know, a lot of people ask us as well in our company, you know, like, why aren't you guys in this country? Why aren't you guys in this country? And at the end, if you don't define a target market very carefully, you're not aiming for anyone at all. So I really like that analogy, Corey. And I think you know all of these blockchains should really have a very defined niche so that they can really solve a specific problem to specific people right and only then you'll know which ones will survive and, and serve a real purpose so uh really well said Corey. exactly yeah yeah absolutely i think you know a real life example that you know people can actually look to and and these blockchain foundation can look to and draw inspiration from is this tiny little country or unrecognized country called Tran Transnistria. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's a little region tucked between Moldova and the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, basically when the Soviet Union collapsed, this was this last, this, this last little pocket of the Soviet Union that actually still remains Soviet, right? If you go to this region today, communist hammer and sickle everywhere. People are still, you know, 
uh, having Lenin statues and you know uh, you know idol you know idolizing the past and thinking about the good old days of the Soviet Union blah 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 right mm -hmm. so what I really want to point out here in this country is their banking system right because they are unrecognized by any government in the world other than Russia I guess. I don't know actually if Russia recognized them, but nobody recognized them, right? So they can't get access to like international banking system or like card processing, Visa, MasterCard, those kind of things, right? So they had to build, Russian entrepreneurs came in and built their own system, their own bank banking system, their own Visa card, you know, not Visa, their own card settlement system, their own everything, their own little niche market. And I'm, I, and I'm, I bet you that, you know, that is generating a lot of revenue for whoever put that up in their first place. So, um, so here is a little, uh, niche market that is, you know, different than the rest of the world that have their own little system that is pretty modern from, you know, the videos and the, the articles that I've read, you know, these banking systems, well, they are modern, just like any other system in the world. They have online banking apps and, you know, online transfer and things like that. So. Um, so yeah, and, uh, that's, so basically that's a really good example of, you know, uh, occupying a niche target market and really dominating it and, 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 uh, being able to extract value from it. Makes a lot of sense. And the final question, Corey, before we actually end, I would love to ask you about a last prediction in 2021. You can choose DeFi if you want, if you want to choose anything else related to crypto, it could be scary, like scare the crap out of you. It could be extremely positive any way you want to take it. But is there anything else that you find extremely interesting or scary here in 2021? Uh, we all know that, um, you know, Parler, the very popular uh, social media platform among uh, Trump supporters recently got taken down. You know, Trump himself, I think, mentioned something about potentially starting his own social media platform, right? That are likely censorship resistant. I wonder which kind of technology platform Trump would put that social media platform on, you know, probably a blockchain, probably a block, you know, probably going to be some sort of social media protocol on a blockchain with a utility token. Utility token that could go up in value as more and more people join his quote unquote revolution. That could then finance his quote unquote revolution. That could then, I don't know, you know, you see where I'm going? Imagine <laughs> political revolution financed by ICO. Gee, right? If only the CIA had that tool for themselves back in the 70s and 80s, right? <laughs> but, um. I think it's very real. You know, I, I think that uh, political revolution that are going to be financed by DeFi are going to be a very real thing within the next 10 or 20 years. And I think Trump is about to catalyze that. I, I For some reason, I have a feeling he's about to do it. So it's inevitable. Right. So uh, we'll we'll see how it goes and uh, how the how governments all over the world react to this. Awesome, man. Well, you know, Corey, it was awesome having you. And of course, we will put all your information, guys. Don't forget to check out Stably.io, Stably B-L-Y, a project that is built in the U.S. and in Seattle and, and some great stuff going on, great partnerships. So uh, congratulations for all that, Corey. And uh, any last message before we go? I guess just, uh, you know, parting word. Uh You know, Bitcoin's, what, 30K, 40K again. Everyone's like, hitting me up now all my friends i haven't heard from in like 10 years hitting me up now i'm like hey what do i do with bitcoin should i buy <laughs> my number one advice to anybody right is don't buy everything all at once up front look yeah. into what dollar cost averaging means look into long-term investing you know uh and dollar cost averaging that alone will be all that you need to know really and, and also diversification right? Diversify. Um, other than that, really, uh, you know, have fun. Uh, enjoy the, uh, you know, crypto revolution and uh, let's uh, get to the moon together one day. <laughs>
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Really, really good tips. I think I've been receiving those calls and messages almost every day for the past week, Corey, which kind of scares me as well, because it feels like we're, we've been entering euphoria, but it's good to see Bitcoin be able to find strong support at the, the 32, 33,000 USD levels. So uh, thank you so much, Corey. It was awesome having you guys. We hope you enjoyed this show, guys. We talked about stably. We talked about stable coins, the trends in 2021, DeFi algorithmic trading and tons of cool stuff so please smash that like button and of course blast the bell notification subscribe so that you can get access to more of these timeless interviews join us every wednesday eight o'clock gmt premiering at a pc near you thank you so much guys